And now I think we're gonna go for our next speaker uh, from Italy, actually, and most of the people excited to know what's going on and how they face this problem actually in Italy now. So uh, our next speaker will be uh, Prof. Uh, Raffaele uh, Palantino. He is actually uh, assistant uh, professor, Department of the Public Health, University of uh, Federico II of the Naples, Italy, Research Associated, uh, Department of Primary Care and Public Health. Uh, Imperial College of London, UK member and faculty uh, of the public health. And uh, he will speak today about the uh, COVID-19 crisis uh, in Italy, management and public health emergency. I think uh, Prof now will start the uh, his, Good afternoon, uh, lecture. Can hear me well and thank you for having me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear you, Prof. Okay. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm going to start with my presentation. If you can confirm, you can see the slides now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we see it. It's clear. Okay. Yes. All right. So it's about the COVID-19 crisis in Italy, the management of a public health emergency. So, but before really going into details about how we're going to manage, are we managing this crisis? I thought about giving a bit of a timeline of what has happened in the past few months. So when in January 30, uh, the 30th, 2020, while uh, the WHO was declaring that COVID-19 was a um, public health emergency of international concern, in Italy, it was also the day we uh, started to um, we close we any uh, direct connection between China and Italy. And also it was the day we implemented a, a series of other uh, civilians action. We were um, monitoring, say the Ministry of Health decided to start monitoring big um, uh, uh, train stations and also airports. Um, so perhaps we were focusing on um, somehow um, protecting the border and while something was already happening inside the country and we didn't know. In fact, in less than a month, on February 21st, we, there was a bombshell in the country. So, we, um, so they found out in a small uh, town in, in the Lombardia region that 15 people were positive for COVID. And the, <clears throat> the big threat was that they were not able to find patient zero. So they didn't have any clue and don't, have, don't really have now. They have no confirmation how the, this um, epidemic started uh, um, in that specific area. But later on, uh, very soon, they started trying to find other outbreaks. And it was in uh, March the 8th that the country decided to close completely the Lombardia region. However, only one day after, there was the, um, the, the decree by the prime minister that decided to that the whole Italy was had to be considered as a red zone. So this action um, somehow replaced what was uh, declared uh, yes uh, the day before. So there was the real um, country lockdown so, um, across the whole country. So all uh, unessential activities were um, suspended or referred, transferred to uh, online. So there was a lot. So um, across the whole country, we started with smart working and you could go out only if it was really necessary to go to grocery shopping or for health um, needs. And later on, there were other actions within the country that just reinforced this um, decree. And also across them, we also saw on the 11th of March that uh, WHO declared this from pandemic to, uh, from epidemic to pandemic status. But this is just, um, uh, as a small video that shows in just one uh, month how the situation completely changed across the country. However, as you can see, even if the epidemic is well spread, still 
it's mostly focusing in the north of the country. And what has been really important is the, um, uh, the surveillance system, which was implemented um, immediately uh, across the country by the National Institute of Health. How did they do? Um, basically not only collecting social demographic, demographic information about those confirmed to be positive, but also looking at their medical records. So therefore they do um, publish a daily uh, bulletin showing all the updates. And thanks to that, we can somehow monitor the developments of the situation. For instance, you can see here that the country is all interested by uh, the epidemic, but of still um, outbreaks are mostly in the north of the country. But we also know that more than 70% of the affected are those that are 50 plus. And uh, this also um, is um, about the fatality rate that's profoundly, as you, we saw with the previous presentation, profoundly impacts the elderly. But we also um, say in line with other uh, findings that uh, it's the prevalence between men and women is different. So men are more likely to, um, to get infected. But also what does the, um, so this um, surveillance system, what does it's also to uh, trace back from the confirmation with the, of the diagnosis, also the onset of the symptoms, because we know there's a lag. And so looking at the medical records, uh, they try to um, continuously try to understand um, what is the, uh, when each person started to have symptoms, because this is very important for modeling. Um, um, because, of course, if the person has already symptoms, it's more likely to spread the infection and therefore it's very important to understand what is the lag between the onset and the confirmation of diagnosis. And doing that, they are um, updating continuously the epidemic curve just to understand and try to model when the peak uh, will be uh, reached in the country. And for a subsample, uh, so for instance, now in Italy, as of the 26th of March, we have more than 80,000 cases, um, so more than China. And, but for a subsample of them, like in this case, it's around a quarter of them, we have even more information. So the granularity is uh, even greater. So we can understand what side of sort of symptoms are presented for each patient. So for the majority of them, it's just past symptomatic or mild, but we know that about 25% have on uh, severe or critical symptoms, which is um, very important. But to better understand the problems we are facing in Italy, we have also to know a bit better how the organization of the country, which is quite peculiar. So Italy is quite small, but in terms of extension, but the area, um, but still it's high, densely populated. It's more than 60 million of people living in the country, which of course is a factor to take in consideration because we know that the higher the density of population, the, uh, the more likely that the virus would spread. But also it's one, the life expectancy is very uh, long. So in terms of the um, uh, mean age is among the oldest countries in Europe, um, together with, um, with Spain and France. And it, which is also another very important factor to take in consideration. But what is very important also to understand is that in the country we have 20 regions and it, there is a, a very strong regionalism in Italy, which also affects how the healthcare is organized. So we have regional healthcare, therefore we have profound differences across um, countries, for instance, across regions, sorry. So for instance, we know that Lombardy region, which is uh, strongly affected is, um, um, that the secondary care is uh, strongly developed and not as much the primary care. On the other hand, another uh, strongly affected uh, region such as Emilia Romagna uh, has a very strong primary care as well. And this is very important also to put in place um, preventive measures. But there are also socioeconomic inequalities and there's a north-south gradients where uh, in south normally they are worse off as compared to the north. 
But therefore, it, it has been, it is very important in the country, especially to monitor how, the, because we know that there's this big, massive outbreak, especially in the north, how the, um, the infection, so the, 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 the epidemic is spreading. Um, therefore, we have been closely monitoring um, the epidemic curve at regional level. Um, so, for instance, these are um, the four countries that have been mostly impacted by the, um, uh, the epidemic. So, I'm showing those that, as of 26 of March, have more than 5,000 confirmed cases. And, but as you can see, even among these four countries, uh, Lombardia is the one which is profoundly impacted with around 40,000 cases, while the others have a completely different slope in terms of the growth of the curve. And also, uh, when you look at the other, uh, other countries which have uh, where the emergency is greater, so those that have at least 1,000 cases after, uh, let's say, a month since the beginning of, so since we found out the epidemic, uh, even here, we can find there's a bit of a gradient, the farther from Lombardia region and that area in general, the, uh, the, the, the smaller the number of confirmed cases. And so there are a lot of why, so we still, there's a lot of unanswered questions about this. We keep answer, asking why is this happening? Why was really that area? Uh, we know there's a lot of trading um, activities, factories are very much implemented in that area. And so there's a lot of also commercial activities and uh, also trading with China, for instance, with Germany. The, the, one of the, uh, the theory was about con contact with, um, uh, with, with Germany as well. But uh, again, also uh, there's weather is different across the country. Uh, with southern that is much warmer, but we know this is a, that's very weak evidence about weather. However, it might still be one of the a weak factor contributing to that. And this is just to show again the two figures, but just to give you an idea. So it's the same scale, just to give an idea how different each region has been impacted by um, the condition. But also what has been very important to monitor is the, the key, considering the regional differences that we have in Italy. So as a key indicator to monitor this public health emergency is the healthcare resource utilization. Because while we know from one hand that the prevalence, the percentage of, that, of ICU, so um, 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 uh, ICU beds, uh, which are um, uh, of among the, those are used for among those that's um, the prevalence among the total of COVID cases. We also, uh, and this is quite similar across the country, so the emerging care unit beds. Um, and so the, the, the longer the period, so for the, the longer the infection has been spreading, the more similar this proportion becomes across uh, the regions. However, what is quite different, and this might also, we are starting to understand in terms of how the regional healthcare uh, organization might also impact the spread of the disease is, the, for instance, uh, the prevalence of the, the percentage of um, those hospitalized across over the total. So, and for instance, if you look at the Veneto region and also the Lombardia region, which are two regions that are uh, strongly uh, affected by uh, the epidemic, you can still see that um, despite the numbers in both cases being uh, um, very high, uh, the prevalence, the percentage of those hospitalized is very different. So this is another burning question that we're trying to understand and to assess, but also we are uh, closely mo monitoring the healthcare utilization for these and also for, uh, of course, other reasons. But also uh, because the, the tension in the country is very, very high, this is a typical case also that a very strong and important message might also be misinterpreted. So it was the 16th of March that the WHA tweeted our, once again, our key message is test, test, test. And this was just a very simple, important message just to um, uh, remind uh, countries that which had been 
uh, diminishing uh, the, the the level of the the, the problem. Uh, just to start uh, taking actions such as identifying ta um, people that might have uh, mild symptoms, just taking actions in order to contain the spread of the disease. However, in Italy, there was already a lot of controversy about whether we were testing enough. And so this just was like uh, lighting up the fire even more. And but so the question was, are we testing enough? Shall we test more? So um, if you look at this figure produced by our wording data, which is looking at data updated up to 20th of March, you can see so it's plotting a total COVID-19 test versus total confirmed cases of COVID-19. And you can see, for instance, as compared with South Korea, uh, which is a country that uh, to a certain extent can be quite similar in terms of the recent age distribution to Italy, wealth, et cetera, et cetera. So the, um, they were testing uh, more than in Italy because you can see it. So the dots is a uh, place quite high, but towards the left of the graph. However, in Italy, they were testing still way more than other countries. So perhaps we were uh, testing probably not as much because we, in terms of our guidelines, we were testing those um, with symptoms. Others, for instance, South Korea were tracing back all the chain of contacts. So regardless of any symptoms or not, and this might be important, but the real question was, shall we do more? Testing more might be a very effective measure when at the very beginning of the outbreak, just to try to confine the interested area. At this point, at this phase of the, the spread of the epidemic, of the pandemic, at least in the country, it doesn't really make sense to test even more. And also what we have to consider looking at this very recently published uh, article um, that's uh, on JAMA, that um, sensitivity of the available tests that we're using at the moment might not be that great. So uh, we know that to test people that might have the disease, we're using a combination of nasal swab and pharyngeal swab, and both have a far from perfect sensitivity. Of course, we're using them in a combination, which, and also we are repeating testing. Uh, just to better uh, try to identify those that might effectively have the disease. However, this is still far from perfect. And there's a lot in terms of the over, little overlap among tests, and this is also to take into consideration. Also, what is important, because this is something completely new, that we have to learn from other countries. So, for instance, we learned a lot from China, and perhaps Spain, which is also um, so where everything is starting now with the even uh, greater uh, pace. Uh, Prof. Uh, Raffaele, you yes. have only two minutes. Okay. Please. So uh, what is important are the non-pharmaceutical intervention that might reduce the impact of the uh, COVID-19, because we know there's still no uh, effective therapy or um, there's no vaccine. So in Italy, as I said, in the 9th of March, we put in place a complete lockdown of the country. This is a very, this has been used by many newspapers. As a picture, you can see the Colosseum, which is completely empty. You can't even go outside for a walk if you don't have a proper justification. And there was this study done by um, uh, Professor Fagson and at all and colleagues at Imperial College that were showing how non-pharmaceutical intervention can help reducing the impact of the disease. And as you can see, this is plotting against the critical care beds occupied. And as you can see, not, no intervention is perfect, but a combination of them, as we're doing in Italy, uh, might help a lot reducing the number of occupied intensive care units beds. But also in terms of the healthcare reorganization, what we did, where many things such as we uh, put in place an emergency line to support those needing. There was a reorganization of hospital bed, dedicated COVID areas just to avoid this to become a healthcare associated infection, restructuring of abandoned hospital, construction of modular hospitals, 
increased national production of uh, personal protective equipment because we know there's a lot, there's a lack of that also ventilators, even the fashion industry, they started to produce PPE. And also there was a socioeconomic support for those worse off and because there was a complete shutdown of activities. So we are provided financial support for companies and local business impacted by, we are providing financial support by the COVID-19 lockdown social support for those worse off, smart working, teaching online. I myself, I'm doing a lot of teaching online these days, but also home bills partial relief. Of course, this will impact, this will be, uh, will create a crisis, which is way greater than 2018 crisis. However, we know that this is just, it is essentially needed so far. But as again, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, no pharmaceutical intervention put in place so far. We know very little about the disease. So what we know so for sure is that we have to stay home. These are the hashtag, the one used in Italy and the one used uh, uh, in, uh, internationally, for instance. And also I'm leaving you just with a few seconds of this very interesting video that shows was produced, was made by uh, this Twitter user and also uh, tweeted by the New York Times showing all the governor and Italian mayor how they, what they're doing. They even in a very peculiar way to try to avoid um, their citizens to stay away. Uh, thank you, Prof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can finish it uh, towards online. And thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate this. Um, actually, uh, um, I'm not sure if we, uh, if you guys.